Trafficking is a crime that's often hidden in plain sight. Understanding what to look for can make a difference in a victim's life and help build a case against the trafficker. It's a matter of assessing what's in front of you. In this video, we'll give you some tools to help you with that, including general information about what to do when you come across a possible trafficking situation. Traffickers manipulate victims using sophisticated techniques. In order to know what to look for, it's crucial to understand the victim experience. Remember what that victim brings into that relationship, brings into that situation, into that contact with law enforcement. Everybody that they've ever trusted has betrayed them. Everybody that has told them, I'm going to take care of you, this is gonna be a new beginning for you, has turned it around and has used that to exploit them. Victims may be vulnerable to traffickers for a variety of reasons. Risk factors include mental illness, a history of physical or sexual abuse, or drug abuse. Traffickers even target teens who are pregnant or have young children. Runaways and youth who are homeless or in the foster care system are at particular risk, as are youth who identify as gay or lesbian. There's a horrific number of kids who are turned away from home when their parents find out they're gay. And when you get on the street and you only have yourself, you sell yourself when you're hungry enough. So whether it's an LGBT youth or heterosexual youth, when you're hungry enough, you'll sell what you have. Sex trafficking may also look different in different communities. In the Hmong community, for example, traditional values may lead families to treat victims as outcasts. They are now um, seen as tainted. There's a great cultural stigma with that. So there's great shame that you've brought onto your family. And so you become quite ostracized by your family. You may be welcomed back into the home physically, but on a daily basis, these Hmong girls experience judgment. They feel shame and they carry this great burden. Trafficking is a particular concern for native youth, both on reservations and in other communities. They are being trafficked throughout our region from ships in Duluth to the oil fields of North Dakota, to Minneapolis, where three-fourths of recent juvenile trafficking cases have involved Native victims. I think they're the perfect victim because, again, they have this mistrust of the systems and it's difficult for a lot of tribes or reservations to offer supportive services like you would see in the Twin Cities. So a lot of times you'll see people that come from outside of the reservation to take advantage of these people and if you don't have a jurisdictional authority over uh, someone that's you know just one city over then it makes it very easy for them to come in and do what they want. Connecting with Native youth can present special challenges to law enforcement. Sometimes you're the first person that they're going to make contact with and that that first impression is going to make a, a big difference for them. Um, so if, if there's any way that you feel you could better yourself to addressing the issues that they're dealing with or understanding it, definitely do what you can to gain that education. The average age of recruitment for underage victims in any community is 13. Adolescent brains may not realize the dangers posed by a sophisticated trafficker intent on exploiting them. Any young person may be vulnerable when approached at the right time and in the right way. Heidi Carlson had a pretty common Midwestern middle-class upbringing. She was often referred to as the teacher's pet. Her father was a pastor, so religion played a big part in their lives. I had the mindset that you save yourself until your marriage. Otherwise, you're spoiled goods or ruined goods. Heidi was awarded an ROTC scholarship and went to the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul. Although she was exposed to it, she avoided partying and drinking with friends until one night when she was raped. 
And so after I was date raped, I couldn't tell anybody because in my mind, I blame myself. And then I'm a bad girl now. I'm in the category of bad. I'm ruined goods. Who's gonna wanna marry me? Heidi's life spiraled out of control quickly. She started stripping and dancing in small town clubs in the Midwest. The stripping evolved into prostitution after she started a relationship with her pimp. Gave me these pieces inside of myself that felt like I was fully accepted as I am. Like I could be this bad girl now and it was okay. Soon Heidi married her pimp and had a son. The abuse, however, was never ending. It was very violent, it was very extreme. He would pistol whoop me in my head, knock me upside my head several times. I'd have lumps on my head, but you couldn't see it. And so I could go turn tricks, I could go on calls, and nobody would know the difference. One of the turning points in Heidi's life came when her father brought in law enforcement to try to rescue her. He came with the police and they were trying to help me. And what they didn't know was that inside the house, upstairs in the bedroom, my pimp held our newborn baby. He had his 357 Magnum that he carried everywhere. And he told me, Heidi, if you step one foot off that stoop, I'm gonna shoot your dad, and then I'm gonna kill the baby. And I'll never forget the image of that, my dad walking away. That's, ooh, that's sick. Five years later, Heidi's husband was arrested. She was able to take her son and flee to Minnesota where they moved in with her parents. But about a year later, her husband showed up on their doorstep. Unfortunately, I took him back. And that's the thing that so frustrates professionals and law enforcement. It's like, how on earth could that happen? You got away. But I didn't really get away. I got away physically, but I didn't get away mentally. Heidi went back to the life she knew stripping, dancing, and turning tricks. When she got pregnant with her second son, she finally realized she had had enough. She went to a battered women's shelter and started the long road to recovery. So through the 90s, my PTSD finally caught up with me, and I ended up having a complete nervous breakdown and, and had a suicide attempt and ended up in the crisis unit, which then finally propelled me into healing. She went back to school and eventually became an advocate for domestic violence victims. Heidi continues to grapple with her past and build a stronger life with her family. Today, she is committed to educating others about sex trafficking victims. Look at us as we could be your sister or your daughter or you know your cousin or you know some close family friend because everybody's vulnerable. Anybody can get into this. Being a trafficking victim is a traumatizing, dangerous experience. Victims experience repeated sexual assaults by buyers, control and manipulation by the trafficker, isolation from friends and family, and the constant threat of violence. They will do whatever they can to numb the pain. I see the experiences as being like a scar on the soul written in indelible ink that the world can't see. They may see behaviors. You might be using drugs as a, um, anesthetizing yourself when you're in street life. In the life, you may be acting out in different ways. Because of the manipulation and trauma they experience, victims may not act as we would expect. One of the biggest effects of trauma on a person's development is that they can't always trust when they're in danger or when they're not in danger it throws off all of their coping skills. So we're, we're wired to know when we're in danger and that fight and flight kicks in. Well, for people who have been um, through a lot of trauma, they don't know what's traumatic and what's not. Everything feels traumatic to them. They don't know how to feel. Some will completely shut down. As a result, they are unlikely to ask for help, to report their own victimization, or even to see themselves as victims. They're afraid. They're afraid for themselves. They're afraid of, for their families. They're ashamed. Um, they feel or they've been led to believe by the victimizer that they won't be believed. They're led to believe by the victimizer that they themselves will be arrested or charged with a crime. They're led to believe by that victimizer 
that they're going to be seen as just being a bad person. Victims may be uncooperative or even angry and hostile. She's going to come kicking and screaming, you know, because that's just the nature of being out on the streets. You know, you gotta, you gotta survive, you know what I mean? And you gotta talk bad and you gotta say things and do things, you know, because if you don't, you're not gonna survive out on the streets. So she's not gonna treat an officer any different. Because victims rarely act as we would expect them to, identifying them is a matter of looking for red flags. Observe the possible victim. Does he or she avoid eye contact? Is she or he unusually hostile, anxious, or withdrawn? Check for tattoos with the trafficker's name or symbol, as well as bruises, scars, or burn marks. Take a hard look at the other people at the scene. Are they significantly older than the possible victim? Does she refer to one of the males as a boyfriend or daddy? See who's holding her ID or other belongings. And listen for sketchy explanations of how they all know one another or inconsistent stories about what's going on. Isolate the victim from the others and note how she or he interacts with you. Does she seem guarded or unwilling to talk? Is he giving you unclear responses to basic questions about where he lives, works, or goes to school? Her responses may be vague or sound like she's been coached. She may not even be able to identify her acquaintances. And remember to check ID and separately interview every person at the scene. Aside from talking with a the victim, there are many clues to consider when coming across a potential trafficking scene. Since trafficking often takes place in a hotel room or home, there are a number of physical red flags to look for. We asked an undercover officer to show us a typical scenario. When you come into a room, look around and see if you can see any of the things that would be typical of a red flag of a trafficking situation or of prostitution taking place in that room. It's not any one particular item of evidence that's going to stand alone. It's going to be the accumulation of a whole bunch of different things that are going to be found in that room. One of the first things you should look for would be vanilla visa cards. They're typically used to post ads on Backpage.com. The next thing that I would look for is lingerie in the room. I would look for fast food that's accumulated, like they've been living in the room for a period of time. Some of the things that would stand out would be pieces of paper with phone numbers and names on it, used condoms in the trash, towels laying around the room that they would maybe use to clean up with between their dates. Some of the other things that you could look for would be alcohol or drug paraphernalia. They may have sex toys. The bathroom would probably be heavily used. The shower would probably still be wet. One of the main sources of evidence that you should be looking for is cell phones, computers, and like SIM cards. Those are going to be things that, if they're collected on scene, will have a multitude of evidence on it. It could be emails, text messages, the posting of their ads, photographs of themselves naked or in laundry or, or very little clothing. So it's important to look at the room as a whole and put all of the pieces together. From the physical scene to the victim herself, trafficking leaves a web of evidence. But remember, one of the best ways to identify a trafficking situation is to talk with the victim. One of the first considerations should be, how do I build rapport? What's this kid need? What do I have to offer them? Aside from just the fact that I have authority and I'm a police officer and I can effectively make them do what I tell them to do. This has to be a relationship that's based on some sort of a mutual understanding and give and take. I'm here to make sure you're safe. I want to take you uh, to a place where they're going to help you. Um, a whole variety of different things like that. If you encounter a possible victim, be patient. Start a conversation focused on the victim's needs and ask some of these questions. What are you doing tonight? How did you get here? How will you get home? Where are you living? How do you get money? What are you worried about? Has anyone hurt you? What's the worst thing that has happened to you? Ask the right questions and you'll get answers you can use to identify the victim and to help build a case against the trafficker. And keep in mind that your actions make a difference. By gaining a victim's trust, you may even save her life. Coming up in the next video, building the case, resources and services for victims, sex buyers, and decreasing the demand.